Welcome back to another edition of the Six Ps podcast. Today we're returning to the longest memory and we're going to be looking at chapter six, plantation owners. Just to give you a bit of a summary, it is from Mr. Whitechapel's perspective, even though this chapter is called plantation owners. And the second person is used in this case, which is very unusual for any text really. So, you know, you are, um, you were, and, and so forth. Mr. Whitechapel in this chapter visits the gentleman's club to meet with other plantation owners and they sort of tease him as they argue over his treatment of enslaved humans, over his Christian values and the hypocrisy over that as well. And Mr. Whitechapel is again sort of caught in those two minds. Uh, he wants to treat those he's enslaved with respect, yet he wants to reap the economic benefits from it. Now, he shares the news of Chapel's death and the backstory behind it, including who Chapel's biological father was and the fact that it was Sanders Jr., his stepbrother, that whipped him to death. And in doing so, it's Whitechapel who the plantation owners praise. And Mr. Whitechapel reflects on this and relieves some of the tension as he sort of is allowed to, to express his emotions about how much he cares about Whitechapel. In terms of the key themes, once again, racism and discrimination is at the heart of this particular chapter, and you could link into that Christianity as well. I think family too is an important value to look at here. We've got power and the power imbalance within society, and freedom is another theme which I think is important here, particularly when it comes to the plantation owners and their views on enslavement. Chapter six, plantation owners. I leave my plantation to face the ridicule of my peers. You are split in two, divided down your middle by contrary reasonings. The half that argues for you to go gains the upper hand over the half that would have you collect cobwebs in the house. Before you know where you are, you have donned your best livery. You insist on driving yourself in a lashing downpour to the gentlemen's club. All the five miles you try to convince yourself you will be spared derision from men you have known all your life. The early evening air is full of whispers, rain in the trees, sunset offers no solace. You are heading for the club your father and his friends helped to build to face the sons of his friends. You feel you should turn back and chain the gates of your plantation behind you, whether the shame. But you know how shame loves the retreat of shadows in order to blossom, how it cannot withstand the glare of scrutiny. The club. Your friends believe you cannot do without them and their insults, because they are all you have. Of course they are wrong, you tell yourself. My friends are my physicians, though they do not realise they are there to heal me. Deeds to your plantation belong to you. There are main gates you can chain behind you. There is a threshold you need never traverse again, but you cannot live with shame. I am a Whitechapel. You think you do not deserve your name, yet your father's dust is between the boards of that club. The rain has switched off. You drink laundered air. You steer the carriage over a dark blue sheet of glass spread across the road and you, and you see the sky it reflects fragment. You look up and find the sky reassembled without a seam. Turn back for God's sake. You don't need their mockery. They are lions, not men, and you are driving into their den. They see your carriage as it draws up to the clubhouse. You climb down from the driver's seat. They wonder about the sanity of a man who owns hundreds of slaves, yet chooses to drive himself in a downpour. Don't hound them. He is a good man beneath it all. We are civilised. They remind themselves you are one of the, them, however far you, have, you may have strayed. What brings me here? My need to be ridiculed? My search for vindication? My confusion? I know the questions because I'm about to ask them. The answers are mine too but I need to hear the words from a mouth I can watch. You own the Whitechapel plantation. Your father helped to build this club. You walk through the front doors as if you were home. The floorboards under your feet welcome you with their familiar creak. Dust between those boards is yours as well as your father's. You are here because there is nowhere else. Home, the boards chatter. Welcome home as you head for the main lounge, relieved of your coat, stick, and hat by a slave you did not see you are so wrapped up in yourself. You enter a smoke-filled room. 
Everyone is on his feet facing you. They are baring their teeth like lions. Here is a man with a whip in his hand. Three cheers, hip hip, hooray, hip hip, hooray, hip hip, hooray, well done. Congratulations, Whitechapel. That was some whip. Mock me all you want. It was a lesson that went wrong. One long overdue on your plantation. The roars, louder than you anticipated, take an age to quell. There is no question of leaving, one half tells the other. A rainwater Madeira finds your hand, interrupts your search for your pipe. You try to sip it, imagining it is tea that is too hot to gulp. Your throat is dry, your clothes damp. You gulp your drink. Slaves will see this as a warning that they can't run. Or that they can run, but can't hide in this region. Whitechapel, you even got a mention in the Virginian. The death of one slave does not make me one of you. True Whitechapel, true, it does not. It makes you a fool. And after all you've said, a hypocrite too. The slaves have rights as humans. They are not just tools. What about this? Show them respect and they'll work hard. They may be inferior, but they're people like us. Lost your tongue, Whitechapel. Roars again. Other people's smoke stings your eyes. You grip your pipe, your tobacco pouch like reins as you try to find your feet. I stand by every word. Every last one. How do you stand by the whip's use? Slaves are humans. Whip them to death. There's proof. This high ceilinged room, whose every proportion is known to you, would have you speak. You stuff tobacco in your pipe. You are offered a light by a hand you nodded in appreciation. You talk between pulling the flame into the pipe's chamber. It red reddens. Smoke billows in your face, but the smoke is yours. Your eyes lose their squint. So, none of you gentlemen has had a whipped slave die. None of you has heard of it except under my roof. And none of you has ever told a single lie. I have not, Whitechapel, taken food with my slave one day and beaten him the next, or fattened him only to have him throw it back in my face by running off no less. My Christian beliefs are still absolutely true. As true, my friend, as your whip on that slave boy's back that sent him to his maker in just one stroke? No, two hundred strokes exactly. I treat my slaves with humanity. Give them your cruelty. Perhaps then they'll survive your whip, as we have tolerated your vanity and superiority. Admit you felt alive for the first time in your life, Whitechapel. If not to us, then to yourself, or else you're lost. Well put. Thank you. Well put indeed. Half of you joins in the laughter. You suck hungrily on your pipe. Your glass is replenished. You are so warm, your damp clothes begin to steam as if smoke issued from every pore of your body. Gentlemen, stupidity, it seems, comes at no cost. Whitechapel is getting insulted, a sure sign of defeat. If, as you say, you can get stupidity for nothing, the capacity to insult must come really cheap. What is cheaper than nothing and is still something? Don't know. Correct, since nothing cannot be known. One can only contemplate something if that thing already exists. The talk sounds familiar. You raise your glass through smoke, throw back your head, tip the last of the, of the Madeira and glance at the ceiling made into a sphere through the clarified base of the glass. Whitechapel, you're an abolitionist. We have an abolitionist in our midst. What should we do with him, gentlemen? String him up. You think of your dead father's warning about the subaltern nature of some of the company you keep. I think, gentlemen, that I am a Christian. We're all of us Christians of one sort or, or another, but you, Whitechapel, you promote the African at the expense of your own white Christian brother. I promote the te teachings of Christ and practice slavery. I do not practice slavery and hide my beliefs. What you are doing will lead to our penury, or a massive slave revolt bringing us all grief. Your slaves eat well, sleep well, do wrong and get off lightly. They'll start to think they're our equals and should be free. That's why your boy, dead from the whip, shines brightly. We thought at last Whitechapel, who was blind, could see. But no, you persevere in your erroneous ways. You actually expect us to condone your views. 
You must be mad. Dangerous. There is no laughter. Smoke in the air seems to warn of an imminent fire. You have been called many things. Gentlemen, let me tell you what it is you would have me choose. Not another lesson. He should be a preacher or a politician. His, con his constituents slaves with a whip for a tongue. What a deadly teacher. Chapel, you took your belt to him as if he were your own offspring. Chapel is young, inquisitive and dead. Your policy of a judicious whip failed to save him. There is only one whip, it eats flesh. The corruption of the whip gentleman does not save plantations. It results in brother killing brother. How so? What, what I have to say is strictly confidential. Naturally, we have our differences with you, Whitechapel, but honour is honour. You mean it, gentlemen? Whitechapel, brother, we really do. Now tell us, what troubles you? Your head begins to swim. You see yourself wading through a sea of smoke. Smoke is above your head. Your arms tug, your legs kick, but objects remain the same distance from you. I was absent. Yes, yes, but your absence does not absolve you. Responsibility is one thing I won't dodge. As Christians, hear me without prejudice. We give you our word as gentlemen and friends. We swear in the name of God. You chew your pipe to steady yourself. One half tells the other there is nowhere to swim, just cloud to tread. The God that tells you to treat your slaves like animals. Wait one minute, Whitechapel. You can't get away with that. You are the one who whipped his slave to death. Our line of work is slaves. We can't change the fact. We do it the way we think best serves our investment. It's not a charity. We are Christians, but Christianity does not equal weakness. We treat our slaves with a firm hand. We're severe in the hope that other slaves will behave well out of fear. You can't mix God with the slave business. God is for us and not them. You've seen their many gods. They've got one for each day of the week and every mood. They can borrow our God if it will make them good, but if God doesn't work, bring back the whip and rod. Whitechapel, our fathers were in this line of work. They did it well, extremely. They did it for us. That's all we know. Our slave plantations put the pork on our plates and the Madeira in that glass in your hand, Whitechapel. Why upset everything when it works? What about goodwill to all men and our children? You hear yourself and almost join in the scathing laughter that follows. By goodwill, Whitechapel, you mean we should free our stock? Where will that leave our offspring? It will condemn them to the white slave auction block. There has to be another way to organise the economy. Other than slavery, I doubt it. Slavery is fine. If slaves were freed and paid, they'd be friends, not en enemies. And this time you laugh at yourself. One part of you speaks, the other laughs. If they were free, Whitechapel, you wouldn't see them. They'd be gone. Where would they go? We have money, we're here. Yet we force them to remain? We're here because it suits us. They're here until we sell them. Take your man, the old slave. What's his name again? The clever one his daddy named after himself. The one our fathers tried to buy for 20 years. Emancipate him and you know what you promote? Demands that the plantation pay him arrears or him in public office giving slaves the vote. Then women will want it. Then where will we be? Your trouble, Whitechapel, is that you see just one part of the picture. You're so close up you can't tell the wood from the tree. My slave, Whitechapel, is noble, honourable, true. He has been tested in ways that would break most men. He is living proof that slaves are our equal in every way, if you knew him better, you would know what I mean. You might change your view when you hear what I have to say. Let's guess. One of your sons has copulated with a slave. Or your daughter. You found a slave you actually don't like? The gravity of my re revelation precludes laughter. We do not laugh. You trust us. That's laudable. Shut up then and listen. The runaway who died. You were absent. This had better be good. And my overseer. Lovers. I give up. You swivel on your heel. Several hands hold you. Voices implore you to stay. The part of you that speaks would have you leave. 
the part that laughs wants to remain. Sorry, proceed. But, Whitechapel, you spin your tail out till the thread breaks. The thread is hardly off the spool, and every time we interrupt, when I attempt to speak, throw us the spool, let us unravel the thread. What? And get it all knotted at the outset? We're educated men, not mules you have to lead. Prove it and stop braying. I've lost the thread. That's because the end is frayed from much licking, threading and unthreading the needle. Instead of sewing the garment and finishing it. All right, here's a tailored suit. Fantastic or feeble. My runaway slave and overseer shared the same father. You've stitched it all too fast. Unpick the thread. Reverse. You heard me speak of my slave Whitechapel's nobility. Whitechapel, the father of your overseer. There's no African in the man. He's white as a lily. Is this alchemy, witchcraft, devilry, or all three, sir? I show you a gentleman's suit, but you see a lady's chemist. Explain. We are not fools. A joke's a joke, but this? You know Sanders Senior. He knew our fathers, yes? Yes. Well, he violated my slave's mistress. She bore the son who ran away and got the whip my overseer wielded. Unbelievable. Were it not from your untrustworthy lips, they should have known. Why were they shielded? I thought Sanders knew. The whole business was shrouded in secrecy. How could your Whitechapel watch and not intervene? He lost a son in deference to authority? Name your price. That slave of yours is a slaver's dream. He's not for sale. He deserves your family name. Well said indeed. If he were white, he'd still be rare. Let's drink a toast to Whitechapel and to his slave. Your glass is full, your clothes dry. The smoke you breathe is shared by everyone. The side of you that speaks is a side that laughs. You raise your glass in a sea of raised glasses. To Whitechapel and the old man. And though Chapel is gone, there is still Whitechapel. Chapel dead, the whip buried, at least on the Whitechapel plantation with him. And there is still old Whitechapel. Whitechapel, whom no grave seems able to claim, loyal beyond the requisition of duty. At last I'm without shame. My name is restored to me. So this is a really confusing chapter. There's a whole heap of dialogue throughout this chapter, and it's sometimes tricky to work out when it's Mr. Whitechapel speaking and when it's one of the other plantation owners that are all sort of grouped together, really. Uh, in terms of the key quotes, it's a long chapter. There's a lot you could sort of pick apart. I've only sort of picked 10 quotes. The first one is the very start. It's, I'll leave my plantation to face the ridicule of my peers. The use of italics throughout this chapter sort of outline and highlight the inner dialogue, the inner conflict that Mr. Whitechapel feels. You could call his psychomachia, his internal conflict about what to do, what to say, that appears throughout this particular chapter. And links to the next quote, you are split in two, divided down the middle by contrary reasonings. There's this continual metaphor throughout this text that is divided in two. It's meant to represent the conflict the inner conflict which he has. And it's a shame that he feels as well about what's exactly happened. And it's not until he unburdens himself that he reveals the truth and that the true extent of Whitechapel's character that he reveals that and the other plantation owners agree in their respect to Whitechapel that he becomes one. It says on page 77, the side of you that speaks is a side that laughs. He's no longer divided into, he's able to, I guess, come to terms with what's actually happened. The next quote is quite long, but I wanted just to reference the first part, but you cannot live with shame. I am a Whitechapel. You think you do not deserve your name, yet your father's dust is between the boards of that club. Once again, we have that intergenerational connection, that sense of belonging with which Mr. Whitechapel feels, not just with the other plantation owners and the gentleman's club, but also his father and wanting to maintain that connection with his father and the values with which his father had. 
The repetition of the word shame is interesting as well. It comes up about four times in the first part of this chapter. Uh, the reason why it's important, I think, is just the connection to the other texts and also the fact that here we see a character with power feeling a sense of shame. I mean, we didn't necessarily feel that with Sanders Senior and we don't really feel it in the seven stages of grieving with the authority figures. So the fact that Fred de Guar has outlined this shame is really important in terms of building Mr. Whitechapel's character. The second last quote, the death of one slave does not make me one of you. Again, he's stuck in two minds. He feels a sense of belonging to the gentleman's club, but at the same time, he doesn't want to, I guess, be grouped in with the other plantation owners. He wants to be seen as different, as someone who does treat those he's enslaved with some respect. And the last quote is, the slaves have rights as humans, they are not just tools. Show them respect and they'll work hard. They may be inferior, but they're people like us. These are quotes from Mr. Whitechapel that he uses that reiterate his views on enslavement, which we already have witnessed in chapter two. And again, it's a hypocrisy that comes from the other plantation owners who criticize him, mock him, ridicule him throughout this chapter. And he finds it very, very difficult to speak up. The next quote again ties in Christianity and the hypocrisy of being Christian, but also being an enslaver. I promote the teachings of Christ and practice slavery. I do not practice slavery and hide my beliefs. Mr. Whitechapel trying to justify himself and run the other plantation owners retorts by saying, you can't mix God with the slave business. God is for us, not them. Again, raising that sense of superiority in which they hold that ingrained racist belief that the enslavers are more superior, that they are human, essentially, unlike the enslaved humans who are subhuman. The next one, the corruption of the whip gentleman does not save plantations. It results in brother killing brother. This is Mr. Whitechapel really criticising the use of the whip, that symbol, that motif that comes up throughout the text, um, which represents oppression. The next quote is really interesting in terms of the context. You know, Whitechapel, our fathers were in this line of work. They did it for us, and that's all we know. This is the justification that the plantation owners have for keeping their enslaved humans. And also the fact that they're very, it would be very difficult to change this. I mean, the next quote there has to be another way to organise the economy other than slavery, I doubt it. That is one of the main arguments pro-slavery was the fact that, well, how are we going to pay for things? How are we going to maintain our e e economy? Again, you've got that uh, quote, you know, our slave plantations put pork on our plates. You know, why upset everything when it works? And it sort of underscores how difficult it is to change ingrained beliefs and just to reiterate that point, you've got the metaphor of the thread that's repeated on page 76 that we saw in chapter two on page 33, this notion of a carpet and a thread. It's so difficult to unravel when these beliefs are so tightly um, held across generations, it's difficult to exact change. The second last quote is just an interesting one they talk about, you know, freeing slaves and, you know, what, you know, giving slaves a vote and then women will want it. Then where will we be? Again, we've got that discriminatory society, that prejudicial society. It's racist and patriarchal. And the last quote here, Whitechapel, whom no grave seems able to claim, loyal and beyond the requisition of duty. At last, I'm without shame and my name is restored to me. There's some great quotations here at the very end of this text in terms of the pride that Mr. Whitechapel feels towards Whitechapel. And the fact that the other plantation owners tend to agree with that, and there's some, you know, there's some more quotes, um, you know, he's as white as a lily. There's a set, there's a simile there. If he were white, he'd still be rare, making that connection to his ethnicity. You know, that slave of yours is a slaver's dream. He deserves your family's name. There's so many positive quotations there to describe Whitechapel which is really interesting in terms of the relationship between an enslaver and an enslaved human. Just quickly, I wanted to touch on some vocabulary, which I think is really important to use in this case. And there's these three words, oppression, repression, and suppression. So I've taken this from grammarist.com. So to oppress means to keep someone down by unjust force or authority. To repress is to hold back or to put down by force and suppress, which is broader and more common, 
then that other two means to put an end to, to inhibit or to keep from being revealed. So there's some crossover between these verbs and suppress often covers all three uses, but oppress usually applies to the mistreatment of a person by or group by a more powerful one. So the oppression of the enslaved humans is evident throughout this te text. Repress usually applies to emotions or urges or refers to the violent quelling of political movements. And again, we can see the repression of freedom and freedoms like education and reading to those who are enslaved. And the last one, suppress usually applies to information. So hopefully oppression, suppression and repression are words that you might be able to use in your essays, in your comparative essays. And again, my rule sort of is suppression is a nice um, sort of overall term that's pretty safe to use. It's like when students don't know the difference between affect and effect, I say, look, just use the word impact if you're ever not, not too sure, and that sort of works. And it's the same case. If you're not too sure, I reckon just use suppress or suppression. So let's look at making some connections between this chapter, plantation owners, and the seven stages of grieving. And I've got only a couple of points here, but again, there's so much more you could look to connect between the two texts. The first one is about the narrative perspective. So once again, we're coming from the oppressor's point of view, in this case, Mr. Whitechapel, and I guess also the other plantation owners, we get their point of view as well. And that's very different to the seven stages of grieving, where apart from say the court report um, and a little bit from a policeman, we don't get that perspective. And I guess that's again, a key difference to the seven stages of grieving. We've had a couple of chapters now from Mr. Whitechapel's perspective. What I wanted to touch on though here is the use of the second person. So, you know, the, the chapter sort of starts with that phrase um, about Mr. Whitechapel, you know, you are split in two, you, know, you are heading for the club, you feel you should turn your back. The use of the second person perspective, I think makes the audience complicit in Mr. Whitechapel's dilemma, in his psychomachia, in his inner conflict sort of wants to put, Fred de Grau wants to put the audience in his shoes and wants them to reflect on what they would do in his position. And this is quite different, I think, to the seven stages of grieving because I think that's targeted particularly at a non-Indigenous audience. And Anok and Malman really want that non-Indigenous audience to experience the grief, the trauma, the dispossession, the loss of culture, you know, the death, all those experiences felt by First Nations people across history, that's what they want to provide the non-Indigenous audience with and get them to reflect then on those events happening. So again, a bit of a difference between the two texts and something that's a bit unique in terms of interpretation. You could definitely analyse the use of second person narration and that's sort of a bit more complex analysis as opposed to sort of referencing a character or a quotation or a particular plot event. The second point I wanted to raise was the abuse of power and hypocrisy and the fact that inherent and systemic racism justifies the treatment of minorities. And here we particularly see the views from the plantation owners and how they view enslaved humans as inferior. Once again, I'm going to quote the invasion poem, scene 10. I know I've quoted that a couple of times already. But that's probably a good sign to suggest that's a really important scene to get your head around because it's quite a flexible scene. There's lots of quotations you could use from this scene that refer to a range of themes. In this case, it's the quote, told not to speak, not to dance, not to do as we have always done. And the way that essentially their identity, their sense of belonging is taken from them. And the last one I wanted to look at today was the use of fear to suppress. So again, the fact we looked at vocab before is, is really important here. The quote I've got from this chapter was, we treat our slaves with a firm hand. We're severe in the hope that other slaves will behave well out of fear. Think about Chapel's death. Think about the fact that all the other enslaved humans had to watch and witness his slow and painful death. That's what they use. They use fear in order to quell any freedom or thoughts of freedom that the enslaved humans might have. And the quote that I think you could compare to is Nana's story in Seven Stages of Grieving. And they describe her as being a woman who couldn't trust doctors, a woman who couldn't speak to teachers or police, who wouldn't answer the telephone and got nervous at the mention of government. This fear of authority is clear within both texts. And that fear is used, as I said before, 
to suppress those minority groups. Something else you could look at it again, I mean, we've spoken about the commodification of um, minorities. Again, that comes up here. They talk about the fact about what we, we could do in terms of how could we run an economy if we didn't have um, enslaved humans. Another connection you could potentially make is the notion of shame, which Mr. Whitechapel feels throughout this text. And I think you could definitely compare that to the story of a brother in the seven stages of grieving, where his shame is less about himself, his inner shame. It's more about shame and his father's shame because he's stuck in this cycle of you know, abuse and crime and addiction. So again, the connection there would be feeling shame in terms of their connection to family, because I think Mr. Whitechapel does sort of feel that shame in terms of his own father. Um, but again, the shame with which they both feel is very different in terms of their position in society. So hope that's given you a couple of uh, ideas to sort of mull over. Uh, but again, go out, uh, have a think about your own examples that you might use from this particular chapter and try and make more and more connections with the seven stages of grieving. And if you're finding that you are looking back at the same quotations over and over again, the chances are that's a great quote that you should use that because it's flexible and adaptable to sort of a number of the different themes.